NeuroTechX is an international community that facilitates the advancement of neurotechnology. Our pillars are community, education, and innovation. We have chapters worldwide, thriving online community, and lots of meetup events. Check out your local chapter. If you don't already have one, please get in touch. We'll help you set one up. Also, check out if your uh, college or university has a student club. If not, please also get in touch. And if you haven't, haven't already, sign up on Slack. Um, check out learn.neurotechedu.com for the online educational platform and sign up for the newsletter. And if you're looking for a job or would like to post one, check out NTX Services Job Board. All right. So, um, yeah, Happy New Year. <laughs> um, how was how was how were the holidays for you post coup or pre coup? Tame. 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 Yeah. I went skiing. Right, you're you're up in um, you're up in Tahoe. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, good deal. Well, I mean, so I haven't, um, you know, I barely got things together for agenda, just a couple of things like, you know, that, that I attended this, this week. And, and um, of course the big SFN thing next week, um, which I dropped in the, dropped in the agenda. Um, certainly, certainly other, there's lots, lots of other things that are going on. Um, but I haven't been following the news or, you know, I, I hadn't actually checked the, I haven't checked our Twitter account <laughs> in a long time either. But um, yeah, uh, obviously the big thing is the Buzz and Review got announced or, you know, I think all the dates for Buzz and Review are now online um, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome uh, set of locations. And let me see where, where I've got that. Uh, yeah, so one of, the, one of the things on that that we were talking about on the call just like a few hours ago that um, is still, still to kind of be arranged, but I think it's probably worth just getting the idea out um, yeah. via multiple channels is that we, we we're gonna have probably a, a gather town for the for the east coast one which is one that i've been involved in organizing where we're gonna have a gather town as like the after event the after yeah. party yeah <laughs> and um uh, but but that can probably be repurposed as and like shared or potentially you know th that that remains to be determined the, but it, it could be something that could be kind of just used uh, by by other um other groups but the thing i wanted to flag was one of the ideas that we had was to have a kind of you know gather town space that has um some booths basically from yeah. uh, companies like, like you know demonstrating or just yeah, hanging yeah, out, yeah, chatting yeah. to people like you'd have in physical events in in the before times <laughs> <laughs> right. um but none of that's been arranged yet you know so we knew we know a few people in a few places who you know have kind of indicated that that could be of interest but i think uh there's there's it, it'd be a good idea to kind of diffuse the idea that um we'd be interested in having representatives from companies hanging out with us in this virtual space in in their you know capacity as representatives but not necessarily in full-on sales mode just kind of hey you know we do this like let's yeah. let's shoot the shit kind of thing yeah um so that's something that we we do want to do but i think the more the more kind of people will we we'll, we, we, we need to ask people and get the message out um so the more channels we kind of pop um let that idea diffuse on the better yeah definitely um and, and you're a bit of a hub for things like that morgan so sure well i mean i'm, I'm trying to think i mean obviously like have you you know the 
certainly the first person to to ask is somebody like Joe. Yeah, uh, but Joe's on the group in the group, so um, okay. he's kind of eaten by default. But okay. uh, so um, that's but the obvious. I, but but certainly for for East Coast, um, uh, you know, I'd love to ask is um, is any anybody like either Lloyd or um, uh, I mean, basically somebody from Cortex Solutions. Oh yeah. Do you, you, you know, I mean. Yeah, well, I've been I've been talking with Lloyd. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Because um, because he's he's the biosemi rep of of the US, right? Is, is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's who we've been uh, gotcha. getting our stuff from. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, also, like the, um, I think it's Trey Gowdy is the uh, is the East Coast EGI mag stim um, represent like he's he's uh, he's had some good stuff recently on them. Um, uh, sorry, um, I don't know who Trey Gowdy is. Trey Avery. Uh, I, I'm going to Google Trey Gowdy later and see who that is. Uh, yeah, so he's he's the East Eastern Regional Account Manager for Magstim, EGI. Um, that might be also somebody to. Um, I mean, as you know, these are these are people who can also talk about like recent research results. You know, kind of primarily from from labs that that they work with, but you know, but it's still a pretty wide ranging group, as well as like all technical aspects of you know. Um, you know everything from high density stuff to collecting electrode positions to you know integration with other you know TMS and I mean you know like they're, they're them in particular it'd be just kind of cool because of the you know they're now joint TMS EEG company. Um, uh, I got suggestions. Um, we'll ping them. I mean, I, you know, the only thing that struck me with all the different dates was just like, like we're kind of missing the opportunity to really share the social, you know, like it, it seems, you know, that seems like a missed opportunity. Like we should be using the, basically grouping by time zones, which which was kind of the original thing, so that the social is all, uh, you know, can be as kind of like as big as possible. Um, we'll, well, we're doing that with East Coast. Okay. We're doing okay. New York, well, we'll, Toronto, we'll, we'll, Boston, yeah. and DC all together. The, the only the, the problem we have, <laughs> I didn't realize that uh, that South America is like four hours ahead of us, <laughs> which just makes it, it makes it tough for Manuel and I. I mean, so we're going to do a separate date just because, you know, we need to capture people's evening time. Yeah, I thought we were closer. Yeah, I know. Um, I did too. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I checked, the, like, checked the map like, okay, this is, you guys are actually... No further east to the east coast um gotcha so let me um i i should have done this earlier but um is there anybody joining us for the first time who'd like to introduce yourself uh sure yeah that's my first time here oh please um i'll do a real quick intro uh my name is ari i run an art studio uh, called Delta Arc, and I do a lot of like virtual. These days, I do a lot of like virtual robotics and virtual uh, human-robot interaction. And I'm really intrigued by the possibility of some of these new devices that have come out that might allow people to do like neural control on virtual robots. So I've actually had a, a few really nice discussions with people in the champ uh, in the in the Slack. People have been like very welcoming, very thoughtful. Um, 
and those one-on-one -on -one discussions have been really encouraging. So I'm basically here to just sort of listen to more about how the space works, what people are thinking about, what my options are. This isn't a like intense project. The uh, the virtual robots are, but like integrating it with neural stuff is kind of just a side hustle. I'm running alongside to see if it's really possible, basically. Sure, sure. Well, it, it's I'm realizing that um, that Jaden hasn't joined us yet, um, and I'll, I'll ping him. I, I, I he got in touch earlier this week, um, so hope, hopefully he'll join later. Um, but uh, yeah, so we've been we've been actually talking about neuro robotics on Tuesday evening. Oh, cool! We wow, haven't in a while. Um, you know, with the holidays. Yeah. But, um, but if you check on Slack, we have the um, uh, we have the neurobotics channel on Slack, and um, and certainly if we're going to have a meeting, like we'll post it there for sure. Um, I must have missed that uh, that channel. That's really cool to know that that's a thing. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. So, um, I mean the. You know, Jaden's like a, a real roboticist, <laughs> and um, who also who, who also works on you know the BCI with with robotics. Yeah, and so he you know certainly he can say a lot more about the the robotics integration itself. So, um, what's the exact exact name of that channel right now? Because I just I just want to flag it. Neuro robotics. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, and so it, it is actually, I mean, it, it, some of that also comes from the fact that there's a, um, as part of the Human Brain Project, there's a neurobotics platform. So that's one of the things that, oh, that wow. okay. we've been pushing is, um, and some of that is, is related to NeuroFedora, which just is like a, a packaging up the software for, the neurobotics platform, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of like it's it, you know it's essentially it's a raw stack plus a um, a web a web front end yeah and but it's got you know a, anyway and they've a, a, as well as like if you if you have an eBrains account or you know there's there's some services as part of Human Brain Project that you can run simulations and things like that. Um, they've been mostly working on like using spiking neural networks, uh, you know, so I, I almost want to call it like computational neuroscience robotics, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, as opposed to say something like Ross neuro, which is like integrating EEG with, with, you know, a robotic system. That's, I think, basically what I'm doing in VR, or what I'd like to do in VR is the latter thing that you brought up. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, if you Google Ross Neuro, like at this point, I don't know how how what our Slack history is in terms of, you know, check the check the Neurobotics channel yeah. uh, history, and you can see um, papers that we've dropped in. Um, but if you Google Ross Dash Neuro. You'll you'll get a, a set of papers from um, from an Italian group where they're you know very much focused on you know kind of like integrating a, a lib uh, um, an EEG uh, acquisition module into into a raw stack. Yeah, and um, you know if, if you're already using Ross. Right. I, I do everything in Babylon JS, which is like 3.js. So okay. all my virtual reality programming is in the browser. Okay. So, I mean, at this point, but are, it's, it's just interesting to see the other ways that people have constructed like analogous situations and different platforms. So I, I do a fair bit of that. Sure. So, um, so Ryan and, and um, sometimes Alex joins us. Um, are doing a lot more of VR integration. If you're mm -hmm. kind of more more interested in that, um, as opposed to you know, I mean, Ross Ross is only necessary if you really are planning to kind of like embody a a, a robot. Yeah, I do. Vir I do. 
I do virtual robotics, so I'm not really okay. looking to transfer into physical robotics. Uh, it's more just like uh, rapid simulation design to test all sure. sorts of things. Sure, sure. I mean, that's 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 the beauty, right? Is that like you can honestly you can do everything in simulation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, but but it, I mean, it really comes down to. Do you have to? Do you really want to use that that raw stack and deal with their, their particular way of building software? <laughs> um, right. If I had a you know multi million dollar budget, then I'd get a quadrocopter swarm. But in in lieu of that, I think I'm going to be doing a lot of VR. Yes, yes. <laughs> we 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 all need more yeah quadcopter swarms. <laughs> um, that that's cool. I, I and. In particular, um, I do want to follow up. Sorry, my dog. Yeah, um, I. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, Go ahead Ryan. Hey, hey, I'm Ryan, one of the people that Morgan just mentioned, and yeah. it sounds very cool what you're working on, and very smart to do things in simulation and. Um, on the web when possible, because that is one of the areas that's going to expand in terms of being a more common default user interface for a lot of apps, for sure. uh, especially uh, as web VR and stuff start to become a bit more usable, though there's still issues, of course. But yeah, if your simulations can over time be shown to be able to apply to real robotics well, or even if they can't always be, it seems like a very cool thing to go after. Because like, I know I have a lot of friends who prefer doing simulation because only like two of my friends actually have easy access to real large robotic like telepresence robots yeah. or robotic arms like I'm hoping to get access to a couple soon um, but yeah they're, those devices are exorbitantly expensive so doing stuff through web simulation makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I originally wanted to uh, explore um, shifting between the viewpoints of different drones. Uh, and the more I researched how to actually do that, you know, in reality zero, our reality, uh, I was like, nope, I'm going to simulate this. <laughs> so that's what I, that was the first thing I did in the simulator was I have a bunch of robots that fly around and you pop into their POV. You just like keep shifting into their POV, so you can see around a building from different perspectives, basically. Have you, um, by any chance, tried um, synchronizing it and creating different types of viewports where you're viewing multiple drones at once? I have. Like, I, would, I would love to do that. There, I think that the idea of like. Um, I would love to do that. That's on my like my downstream to-do list. I think it would be really good sort of like, I don't know what to call this, but like human perception experiments of integrating multiple views, maybe while navigating, you know, there's all sorts of like cool perception studies you could do based on that yeah. idea. And based on what cameras you use. You could simulate a lot of different eye types very accurately. Yeah. Though morphing between them in real time would be very confusing for most people. <laughs> I think that uh, just as you kind of adapt, you have to adapt to the VR environment itself. Yeah. It Take some time, then adapting to different kind of camera setups would also take some time. So Ari, like, just just for kind of clarity, you put some links in there. So, so if I get it, understand correctly, you're like making these mostly digital, or there's some non-digital. Non, I saw you guys have like real installations on on the web page there, but 
Uh, you're making these digital like landscape, uh, you know, environment things, and then and then making that having them as art installations. Uh, if you look at past work, they were all on buildings, but the project that I just dropped there from my website, that's just virtual. So like previous, previous work is usually was on building facades, but all the most recent stuff is in VR, basically. Um, I think during the early part of the pandemic, I switched from buildings to fully into VR because I guess, you know, can't do anything. <laughs> so It's very cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this, the I didn't realize, I had a conversation with a gentleman named Garrett in the Neurotech uh, Slack, and that conversation really blew my mind. I did not realize how far the space had progressed, um, how much was accessible to, you know, I don't know, like a moderate level programmer or something, like just a very curious person, I guess. It seems like there's so much happening and it has it is beginning to become accessible to developer. Maybe I'm wrong. I th like beginning to become accessible to developers in a way that I really, I really didn't think that was happening in the past or something. Uh, I'm trying to find um, trying to find a link. Uh, it's like University of Central Florida, and I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember the lab's name. Um, but what I what I really wanted to find was the, you know, it's not so much Ross and Neuro, but um, but basically the the drone drone controls, <laughs> right? Drone drone API, yeah. Uh, and this this is a lab that has in particular has, um, yeah. I mean, is has kind of worked on BCI of, of drones in a in a you know a kind of playful gaming kind of way that's uh, a that's a nice way to find that because some of the direct funding for this is like military funding which i'm sort of trying to like steer around to the extent that i can as i explore this space basically yeah i mean i i right i mean i'm not sure what you know what you'd get gain um well, I get, you know, certainly in terms of military stuff, uh, you know, a lot of focus on, on, you know, capturing like um, drowsiness and, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't actually work as a sort like super low latency uh, uh, control controller. Uh, it, actually, it, actually, it does. Does. Uh, there was an experiment. Uh, I saw a research paper, a research like a poster at the BCI Society at the last meeting uh, in Asilomar, and it was this guy. I forget his name, and I forget the paper, but I'll look it up really fast. But they used basically imagine a group of soldiers in a Humvee, like an armor or like a little car. You know, four dudes in a car with helmets on. Those helmets have like basically BCI strapped to the back of them. Yeah, and uh, and and they're looking at event-related potentials from, uh, you know, the brain has an event-related potential when it it knows it made a visual mistake, like it didn't fire an alert when it was supposed to, like it saw a face but it thought it uh, didn't see a face or something, and uh, they're using that to detect threats in simulated like virtual or not virtual reality environments. I think it was like a simulated car environment. I forget the. The specifics of the implementation, but um, but yeah, I, I do think there's low latency uh, use cases for military, um, and and I can provide some some papers for that. Um, one thing that is interesting from that though is just like there's a, a lot of uh, interesting work people are doing with submersible UAVs or submersible uh, vehicles that are unmanned and. Uh, you can do fish identification. So where I come from, there's a huge abalone die-off and uh, a whole species of starfish went extinct within a, a year. And uh, it's a huge hassle to have uh, divers like survey the water. But if you have dive, if you have people driving these, you know, unmanned 
uh, submersible vehicles with cameras on them, they can identify starfish and whatnot, or urchin, or abalone, or lingcod, or all the variety of the fish in the sea. Um, and you can use AI to help, you know, you have a supervised training like model, and you can also use AI to help detect things that the humans didn't detect for like air correction. Just as like a, a way to not have a military use case that might be like, um, you know, applicable to expanding our understanding of the biodiversity of the sea through manned and, you know, AI assisted um, surveying. Yeah, I, I don't know if you remember that, uh, or if you if you joined us that the evening we had um, a woman from um, from like Monterey. Um, I forget what the the particular institute she was working. Maybe like she, I think she was from Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz, and um, you know was involved with the submersible vehicles that um, that they had and was interested in in you know saying that like because of the super complex controls that she was inter interested in kind of like you know ui uh um neuro neural measures or you know somehow bci for for ui uh improvements um but do, do do drop a link in that paper if you if if you've got an example of of um, you know BCI improving kind of like yeah real real control systems. Um, I, th I think there's also a lab in the University of Delaware that is DARPA funded that is specifically investigating that. I just did a search for it again and can't find it, but I know I have it in my notes somewhere. Yeah, I, I can't find it. I, I want to just find this one particular, I mean, I, I, I haven't talked to the PI, but I've talked to one of his master's students and um, it, just in terms of the drone API and, yeah. you know, uh, so, I mean, I, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love for us to have some, some good examples to, to point people to. Yeah. In terms of like a GitHub project or something, yeah, um, you know, it, it's some of the student clubs still end up just trying to control a light bulb, <laughs> which right. you know can be challenging enough, or it seems to be challenging enough. But um, uh, but you know, I'd I'd love to be able to you know just use a, a you know like a little little drone is, example. You know, is, is there like a name? Um, maybe this the field. Like maybe this, maybe the field is already doing this, so it doesn't need a separate name. But is there a field of human computer interaction that's specifically focused on like neurological devices? Is there like an is there like a way to search that that's really targeted? Well, so so I mean, certainly not not a generic term, just because like there's a lot of use cases, right? So. Right. Is it for you know fine prosthetic control, right? Right, or is it l literally you know uh, brain computer interface in right. the sense of like you know UI UX, right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you 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 end up you end up pairing it with a with a number of things, but I, you know, I I, I can say. And I've I've invited some people to the Neurotech Paris um, meetup, um, only because they all the people that I've I've met so far or seen so far have have been European, um, but in um, computer human interface or you know c conferences that use CHI, and I don't know what the history is there why they use CHI, mm -hmm. um, but uh, that was actually one of one of the examples where I think it was, you know, somebody was showing off like an emotive drone control and, you know, yeah. for instance, and I was like, oh, you know, what, what are, you know, what's your field? And he was like, CHI. Cool. Yeah. Um, but, but definitely, I mean, like last, uh, last month at the, at the Paris meeting, um, we had somebody who was focused very much on 
uh, um, lower limb uh, prosthetic, you know, sensory feedback and like low, low latency and was talking about like all the benefits um, from a, from a prosthesis with, with mm -hmm. sensory feedback. Mm -hmm. Like, like, and some, some really super cool examples of like the person navigating like big sand pits <laughs> and, and like how much, you know, basically like a sand obstacle course. Yeah. And you know, how they, how quickly they were able to, to do that with sensory feedback, without sensory feedback, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some, some really, some really cool stuff there too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued. This is sort of, it's not, this is not my like primary field, but this is, a a control mechanism, a potential control mechanism that I find to be like extremely fascinating. So I'm just curious about it and happy this is happening. Cool. Just a, cool. a side note. Um, so we mentioned Jaden a few times, who is, who is a resident <laughs> robotics expert, but I saw on your website, you have this project listed and you're linking to the, the Neurosity Notion. Uh -huh. And uh, Jaden's a bit of a dab hand with that device as well. Oh, cool. Wow. All right. How's it going? Handy. Hey, hey, Jason. Hey, Jaden. How you doing? Good, good to see you <laughs> yeah. There. yeah. Yeah. Hey. I just popped in uh, about 10 minutes ago. Cool. Um, okay. It's, it's 640. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, John, you want to, any, any updates on EEG notebooks? And um, I mean, it's been the holidays, so like, uh, not really. <laughs> no, um, nothing, nothing major, no. Just, uh, I wanted few, uh, to myself very quickly. A few things okay. breaking here and there. Sorry, go ahead, Manuel. Sorry, I, I wanted to introduce myself very quickly. I, oh, I oh, please, oh. please, yeah. Uh, um, well, uh, I actually participated in the, in one hack night, but it was in in the France French uh, branch. So I, I don't know many people here, but uh, I'm, I'm my, my name is Manuel. I'm from Bolivia. I'm actually trying to uh, grow the the, the, La, the Latam community a little bit as well. Um, I'm working on mental state recognition systems. I'm very interested in active and emotional uh, re classification and recognition tasks. I'm also working on a um, uh, simu robot simu simulation, like you guys talked before. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I started programming, doing video games, and, and I like that side a little, uh, a lot, actually. And I just started working with a, uh, in like a simulation of a, a, a kind of robot, a, a robot arm that you, uh, uh, that is meant to be used with, uh, with, uh, with, with EMG signals. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in this field. <laughs> and anyway, I'm not from robotics. I'm actually, uh, I'm from a psychology background. So I'm interested uh, because I'm really interested in trying to one day translate this this kind of technology and research to real life uh, settings for rehabilitation and people with, that have I don't know motor um, difficulties and well well um, I really like the side of of experiencing uh, of experimenting with simulations and virtual reality. We have our virtual reality lab in the in the university as well, and we're trying to uh, project related to simulated uh, environments that try to at least uh, um, to try to evoke uh, as more emotional response. Um, where we're very excited. We're trying to get involved in, in more projects that uh, that are kind of related to this to this type of technology, this type of field. We're working. On, we're also working with the Neurotech X um, Student Club in this uh, project of the Robo Arm, the 
dissimulated or alarm. And yeah, I think it's actually a great, a great mix of technologies regarding um, biosignals and XR technology. We're, we're mainly working with Unity. We are not working with, uh, with web browser-based technology or something like that. But uh, I find I found really interesting what uh, what you guys were saying before about the web and the framework and the technology to uh, to make that possible. I don't know if you could uh, if Arl, you could uh, repeat the name of the of the framework you you are using to develop this your project. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put two different frameworks you can use that are both web-based. Great, great. Thank you. Um, they're both like, you know, again, if you don't decide to use them, like, who cares? They're both cool. It's always cool to look at, like, the way people, different people construct how to do, you know, how to do things. Um, yeah. those, those two are very similar. I'm using uh, the first the first one. Great. And both are based on JS? Yes. OK, great. So yeah. uh, are your projects online? I mean, can I use it just in my Oculus um, device or something? I, I have it hosted. Why don't I drop my email, and we can maybe make a time to go there together if you're curious and want to look at it. Yeah, sure. Great. Sorry, just sir. The answer is like it's always online, but sometimes I'm doing really weird things to it, so it won't be nice to people just showing up. So I have to like set it into a certain configuration for people to drop by. Yeah. Yeah. At some at some point, you should you could maybe give a presentation during um, one of the neurotech meetings here um and like tell a couple of us to go in like i have my vr headset sitting over on a table my other ones in a another place and i know a number of people who would be interested oh, cool. yeah. as well to see yeah. i'm i'm uh trying to get close to user testing not quite there but like close <laughs> cool yeah yeah, super interesting, and um, uh, I just uh, I, I mean, if I heard right, Manuel, um, you're working with robotic arm, right? Yeah, like a simulated robotic arm. Okay. Like okay, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely. I mean, like like the drone. It's one of the examples that I really wish we had a, you know, a, a good you know good project to point people towards. Glad you're working with. Um, you know, working with Neurotech X or this, you said student club. I mean, yeah. it's that, that's, that's your student club. Um, who's, who's the other guy there? Um, I just sent a, a, okay. a photo. I don't have any videos of the project where I'm uh, sure, sure I will, I will prepare a project, a video soon. So cool. I just, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, so one of the one of the things that we've certainly talked about at the the hacker space here in San Francisco, Noisebridge, um, with the Dream Team is is having you know using simulations, but also actually having a having an arm that people could also connect to and, mm -hmm. and play with. Yeah, you know, and and it gets it kind of like you know this kind of Ross story in terms yeah. of. You can do everything in simulation, and and then easily kind of take control of certain devices if they are compatible with a, a particular software stack. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's actually kind of uh, dangerous to try to manipulate a robo uh, real robotic arm because they are very heavy, and and if somebody, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It just yeah. It happens to be. Yeah, you need a uh, compliant control system. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I actually could pull up a video of controlling some massive, like, 
10 ton robotic arms right. with EG. Um, one of my friends in SF did an art piece where two, two people, um, each one was controlling a single ginormous 18 foot robotic arm. And the old goal would to try to get the robotic arms to interlock with each other. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact project name, but the videos are crazy. Um, like the Rodan sculpture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is it is really hard. Uh, whereas, yeah, compliant control robo small robotic arms would make a lot more sense. Like, if that thing slaps you, it will hurt. But it won't take your head off. Yeah, but I mean, you know, this is this is. Uh, I mean, one of the videos that I certainly saw getting getting some play over the over the holidays was this um, Johns Hopkins one. I don't know if, if people saw that, but um, you know, a uh, a real you know invasive brain computer interface uh, where he's controlling two arms and then feeding himself, controlling two robotic arms, and. Um, you know, and this is the real, right? I mean, this is where your, your software can actually hurt somebody. <laughs> that's the, uh, is that the tech that's being used for Adam Limbs? Um, Cause they're licensed out of uh, Johns Hopkins APL. Maybe it, that, that sounds, that sounds right. It did. Yeah. That's some, uh, that's some really, uh, really high level stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was he was doing some like, you know, it was it, the the video was really showing off kind of like the fine motor control, right? But you know, these kind of like safety concerns are are totally valid too, right? In the sense that like these arms could you know can potentially do a lot more than you know your arm, um, and yeah. So it's 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 a big question of of how to you know how to do that that programming for for safety. That's where that uh, ABR adaptive controller comes in. Okay, so it, I mean this is this is kind of like a well um, a well trodden area. Yeah. Okay. It's, so the compliant control, what that means is basically that the robot arm has a specific force that none of the joints are able to uh, go over. So like if you get in the way, then it wouldn't be able to produce enough force to move you out of the way. And then the applied brain research, their whole thing is that it's adaptive. So it doesn't have to be a hard coded limit sure. and they can add tools and stuff to it. And then if someone gets in the way, they can respond to that, th things of that nature. Gotcha. Good. Um, sorry, I'm trying to multitask here. But um, hey, um, just wanted to also say, is there anybody else who'd like to introduce themselves, especially if it's your first time here? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Charlotte. I'm a UX researcher with a background in clinical psychology and just really interested in learning more about neurotech. Um, so just listening today, but that's me. Great, no, 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 that's awesome. Um, it, are there any questions that in particular or things things you'd like to hear more about? Um, anything re related to psychology and the brain and I, I'm really okay. new to neurotech, so. No, no, no. Uh, uh, psychology will come up a lot. <laughs> Great, yeah. Uh, now, do you have any- you got carrying psychologists on the call, <laughs> one or two. Do, do you have any experience with things like ERPs or, you know, it, it, when you say clinical psychology very much like you know, psychopathology or? Yeah, it was more of psychopathology. Um, I have my master's in psychology, clinical psychology and research. Um, so it was more of psychopathology, trauma, um, sure. global mental health. Um, so, yeah. And uh, in terms of, um, I mean, are you practicing? No, I, I my program was not a licensable program. So, um, 
Hence okay. me getting into UX research and also because I find it really I see. I, Oh, got, got you, got you. Right, right. Okay. And um, it's so we, hard to be a, like, a certified psychologist. I think right. there is a transition into tech. I think it's more easier. Yeah. I'm a I think, yeah, I think this was a better path for me um, than, you know, listening to uh, patients all day. So I prefer. Right. So, so we've we've kind of brought up UX UI a couple times uh, already this this evening. Um, what area do you actually work in it, it, with with that you know particular? Yeah. Um, I I specialize in digital health products. Um, okay. So my last job I was at Wildflower Health, which was a mobile app software for. Um, women and families and pregnancy. Um, so also kind of newer to UX um, and looking for my next opportunity. Gotcha, gotcha. And are you here in San Francisco? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Did, did you see the UCSF Digital Health uh, Awards? Oh, not this year, but um, my company last okay. year in 2019 won the Femtech Award. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, well, I mean, it, it, you know, it's it. Yeah. I mean, in in psychiatry, you know, there's there's like a lot more. There's a lot more people working in digital health, or well, I shouldn't say that. There's there's a lot of people working in the digital health products in, in psychiatry, in particular. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, there's there are also a lot of people working on various animal models and lots of other research areas too. But, uh, but that's cool. And okay, so do you do any app development? Um, no, not not at this point, at least. <laughs> um, and, and, and so <laughs> what I was feeling out there was, and I I forget who um, who brought this up recently. I think it's I think it's somebody on Slack, but um, you know we've got this EEG 101 app, uh -huh. and it's a React Native app, and uh, and as far as I can tell, like n nobody's built it in years, um, and you know it's listed on, it's listed on I think learn.neurotech.edu, um, but uh, I mean as as like you know, check this out from the Google Play Store and it, yeah. it's a dead link. <laughs> and, oh, no one picked it. And, you know, um, I'd really like to, um, yeah. I mean, I, I does, uh, John, do you know any of the history of that? There's Dano. EG101, yeah. I mean, I don't know who started it actually, but there was uh, Dano and Tom and, and Hubert and or yeah. I think some of the people contributed to that from the Toronto crew and um yeah, yeah unfortunately it, it isn't there on the app stores anymore right because it's out of date but so, it, it probably the best place to, if, you, if you kind of the concept the place to look now for the concept is the EGEDU um EGEDU. site because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's that that was the motivation for Kyle's website right I oh. see so what it was, what EG 101 was, was a really neat, I mean, what is, but you know, like I said, like we were saying, it's, um, yeah. it, it didn't, it hasn't been maintained. And, and that basically means with mobile apps that yeah, I know. after a few years, you don't exist. Um, but it was about kind of 15 um, or 10 to 15 pages, essentially, um, of a kind of somewhat interactive tutorial there was a, a mobile app that also would stream data from a mobile EEG device and um, kind of introduce you to what a signal looks like, uh, what it looks like when you do certain processing, like apply a filter, mm -hmm. uh, you look at the power spectrum, and it would like stream it in real time and kind of compute these metrics in more or less real time yeah. as part of this tutorial. Um, so it was, it was really neat, and it was, you know, a really, a really good onboarding um, tool for just getting people like first exposure to the idea of brain science, amongst other things, as well as neurotech. 
So, but yeah, you, you'll you'll have a bit of difficulty using EEG 101 now, but that concept I just described is there on the website that's just linked to on the chat there, EEG EDU. Um, and I guess it works. Okay, so, I mean, you can view the website on a mobile app. I don't think you can stream to mobile. I think that website only works with a Mac, right? Am I, 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 I mean, that I, you know, I, I think he's only tested it with a Mac. Um, but, um, um, I, you know, I want to say that maybe Mayan could had tried it with a non-Mac. Oh. Or, you know, certainly, because I pointed, he, he would, he'd been asking about JavaScript interfaces to Muse. And I pointed him to that project. And he said it was useful. <laughs> that I just... You know, this was a long time ago, yeah. um, uh, but I would love to check in on that. I mean, I'd certainly like to to get this, app, you know, get this link off of the. It, it's like the first thing you. It's the first link on lessons and modules. Uh, Learn dot <laughs> Oh right, okay. Yeah, like I, you know, I think the the place to go to if you haven't been there yet. Um, Charlotte with with UX with Neurotech and like EEG Neurotech is a Muse app, yeah, which is it's really slick, you know. I mean, it does what it does, and it's a certain kind of amount of mystique to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's very uh, idiosyncratic, I think it's fair to say in in like what they're doing and how they're doing it, but just the the um, the design and the UX. Yeah, it's actually I've, been, I've always been pretty impressed by by awesome. those apps that they've developed. Well, I'll check it out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, also, I'm open to freelance and volunteer opportunities if you guys ever need any UX or have any projects that you need um, user like, research help with. Well, I mean, I, I, I assume you don't have any um, EEG devices, and I've I've totally emptied this room, so I usually have EEG devices sitting here. Uh, you don't have a Muse or anything. No, no. Um, you know, when when we can have in person meetings again, um, it's something. There, thanks, John. Uh, it, it's something that we would bring, you know, so that people could play with it and at least you know be collecting like time series off themselves or you know seeing seeing what. Um, seeing how to do that and then how to to do some processing off that and um john do you uh, you know the one the one thing that um uh i don't think we got a chance to talk about was uh, talking with alex grenfell and um denny uh yeah because that was like the day after i think our last meeting yeah that was that was quite a good conversation you know so we um so the rationale behind this is actually Hubert's idea. Um, yeah. After the the brain hack um, sprint that we did on EG Notebooks, and because Hubert works with Alex Granfor, and to people who don't know Alex and Denny, I, actually I thought it was Denny, but it's not. It's Dennis, isn't it? Because he's German. It, I kind of assumed German? that he was in. What well, he sounded German. No, no, no. It, it, you could be, you could be right because I'm saying it the French way. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I always did that, and I thought I've never like you know hung out with those guys. But I always assumed it was Denis. But it must be. I think it's Dennis. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, these guys, they're the, the kind of developers of this software tool called MNE, um, which is one of the best open source scientific software libraries around for neuroscience and specifically for EEG and MEG. And you know, so both in terms of the the functionality for the things that we're interested in, like brain data processing, but also just the the way the projects run, like and the way it's done as a community project, it's really kind of exemplary. Um, there's a certain amount of social engineering or community building that they they really kind of have that formula nailed down. So so we're gonna try and follow suit 
uh, in in some respects and and reproduce some of their try try and achieve some of the things they achieved in terms of um, those uh, yeah as I said both the software components and the extra software components like um, you know building uh, processes and you know like social infrastructure for want of a better word um for open source community projects um so we had a chat with An with alex and uh, and dennis and got a lot of good advice about um specific things that we could be aiming for the bottom line really was just talk to people more uh which is straightforward to do as in get the get the message out try and make sure that everyone knows about your project um we can do that i and i, and I know that it works but I also know that I find it annoying when other people do that. <laughs> but I think it's still something that you need to do. As in, like, I find it annoying sometimes when people go about Nylon all the time, even though I use Nylon. I think Nylon's brilliant. But it's like they they go on about it all the time. But I think uh, I think that is like just straightforward good advice. There is uh, reach out to people and say, "Hey, we're building this tool. Um, are you interested in helping? Are you interested in using it? Otherwise, just." here you go it's good to know about that was the single specific thing i would repeat and then yeah, those are the things that we'll try and build in in terms of the kind of github based develop developer community growing um agenda that we're also trying to work on well and and i think it's it's super awesome that um that of course eg notebooks is going to have a, a a place in the buzzing review right so, so I mean that, that that's that's an awesome opportunity to to also kind of get that conversation started with a bunch of people, um, and you know I think after that last code sprint, like so so ready to to take on another one, you know, and focus on particular areas. I brought up my my doing experiments with Psychopi book. <laughs> which I wanted to I left, left in the other room, but, um, you know, the, well, no, push it. Let's see it on the screen. Take it forward. Great. Oh, wow. I didn't know about this. So, yeah. So, good? so I mean, you know, it, it's, um, I mean, this is this I thought would be one of the things that you know could be its own kind of special sprint, which is just fo focused on new experiments, right? Because there's already a lot of good training material for PsychoPy. You know, they've they've actually been doing a, a number of of um, of new kind of intro videos, and you know. Part part of it is that they they've got real funding for you know a bunch of engineers, and um, they've been been producing some new um, some new content for that. But um, yeah, just you know that that would be an awesome you know along with a focus on getting new uh, devices supported, you know, like say doing something with the SciKit people who've, um, who've got emotive support and trying to, you know, having, having a kind of like focused sprint with them in terms of like, Hey, could we, can we get PsychoPy working with, with the motives, you know, I mean, with, with basically EEG notebooks. Anyway, I mean, but certainly buzz and review to get to get people, you know, get more people aware of the project. And, um, and yeah, like, I think the code sprint was great in terms of getting the, the GitHub. And I mean, I know there's still some things of documentation, but um, updates updates that are needed as well as just you know going through and and making sure that the 
the various pieces of documentation that were done at, at various times are, are kind of updated to the new the new way of doing things with the CLI and stuff. Yeah, it's actually the, the that that stuff which was a big focus a little while ago. It's kind of I feel like it's taken a back seat with all the CLI stuff that we've been getting in now and oh sorry, the, the CI stuff. And um, oh, yeah. Yeah. other kind of code base wide modifications over the last yeah, like a few a few months basically. Those those of and and the installation things as well, kind of the uh, dependency tracking. That, sure. That kind of took a bit of bit of focus off patching up that gaps in the documentation, which is still on something we need to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but um, you know, that was that's so so helpful. I mean, I know I know Sylvain uh, has been you know super appreciative of Eric's time um, doing the same thing with Moab. <laughs> oh, he has been okay. Yeah, yeah, kind totally. of machine. <laughs> it's a machine. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, it, it, he knows it well. I mean, that's that's great, right? Um, uh, so I, d I don't think there's been any any real news on Gitter, which is you know, I I'm sorry we have have added another platform. <laughs> um. I mean, I like what you know. You you were really trying to focus on using GitHub as you know for for everything, like discussion on GitHub as well as all the tracking and stuff. Yeah, we're still piloting the discussions feature, um, but there's been some yeah, there's been some you know discussions on there. Not not super recently, but uh, it's still in the pilot phase, I guess. I mean, it still is a beta feature, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just just checking. I, you know, it was it was super cool. Um, the last uh, the last Moab uh, developer meeting though was was awesome. Um, we were joined by um, uh, Yan from from Freiburg. Um, I think he's like joint Freiburg and Radboud. Um, anyway. It, it was it was really um, it was great to see you know and uh, see what because uh, he's he's you know adding adding new data sets and and certainly trying to bring you know trying to update uh, a lot of the you know get rid of old issues that that were put in like three years ago and haven't been followed up and have now been totally superseded by the current you know current repo. Um, uh, but for anybody who is interested, please check it out here. And um, uh, oh, yes. OK, great. Um, so yeah, buzz, buzz and review is coming up. Um, We've got, I haven't actually checked it out, um, but I think Mohit's posted a, a draft of, um, a draft of the content. Is that right? Yeah, the slides have been shared. I haven't actually perused them yet, but they exist. Um, yeah, so many, um, so how many, one, two, one, uh, I mean, it's almost, almost 20, 20 meetups. Pretty cool. Okay. Um, yeah, I think he, he was waiting for um, I didn't even really know where to start on this. Like he wanted a summary of what we've done 
at, with Hack Knight <laughs> this last year. And, you know, like... Yeah, I, I I wish we had a better record of it than just the literally the, you know, the meetup agendas, which uh, unfortunately aren't very um, aren't very easy to. You need a bit of space, dude. Yeah. <laughs> we need a, we need another hackmate to to just like scrape all of the previous meetups for the last year and just. <laughs> I, I, just compile it into a markdown file or something for the upstream. Run, run some audio, I don't know, audio text to send to text, oh, right? Do we, do we need Jasper? I can do that. Send to Jasper. I can totally do that. Jasper gets oh, my over. Be text search. Okay, anti gravity, huh? Is that a. Oh, shit, I left my mic on, sorry. I, I have bad service where I'm at in my kitchen, so... Yeah. <laughs> but you, you can... This this is actually a solvable problem, so we can we can solve that. Okay. Just book. Uh, I mean, I think, I think it, to some degree, I think, you know... I think what Mohit really wants is is some kind of, you know, best of the year, you know? So whether it's like a list of kind of like the, the best um, companies that came to talk or, you know, best research talks. I mean, I definitely want to, um, you know, I loved um, Mohita Garwal, remember from um, Georgia Tech talking about human in the loop re reinforcement learning. Um, that was that was a super awesome uh, presentation. Um, uh, Sorry, just chiming Ryan in. Field. That sounds amazing. Do you have that uh, recorded somewhere? Oh yeah. Sorry, is that I, I can't tell who who's talking. Um, uh, it was it was Ari and I. Was Ari, okay, Ari. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, everything, everything. You're you're on camera right now, <laughs> so we're we're streaming and and everything is archived on YouTube, so you can check out Neurotech X, uh, Neurotech X's YouTube, and you have every every hack night going back um, to basically to lockdown, uh, mm -hmm. in, which in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. is like, Sorry, how would I search? What was that person's name? Oh, so so this is this is the the problem <laughs> is that uh, what I would need to do is um... we need to transcribe all of the meetings. So, so you know how I think I can do this. So if I check Messenger, <laughs> that could work. Uh, you know, so, so Ari, part of the other problem is that we use the free version of Slack, so we lose all our Slack history, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So it's like I could search for for a Garwal on Slack, and it, it's probably already down the memory hole. I see. Um, hey, now, everyone. This is Sagar. I'm a friend of Mohit. He actually sent me a link to this thing. Oh, God. My first time here, so I posted his name in the chat just for reference. Yay! Uh, thank, thank you. you. So much. Um, yeah. So, would you would you like to say a bit more about yourself and what brings you here? Sure. Um, um, Mohit and I were together at Georgia Tech as grad students, and um, actually, before I joined Georgia Tech, I used to work um, in brain computer interfaces. So I've used emotive. I it was the classic like um, trying to extract EG signals to control the robot. We did uh, steady state uh, SSVEP. Sure, I'm sure. A lot of you are familiar with that. Sure. So, like it was my first 
sort of interaction with research. And that's what inspired me to pursue a PhD. And oh. Mohit was actually, he's, he was doing his PhD in brain computer interfaces. So we like talk about it. Um, I did my PhD in trying to improve um, the quality of sound heard by cochlear implant patients. So it was more on the neural prosthetic sides, but um, I'm very familiar with the basic concepts of what goes into the VCI. And, and did you say it's your first time here? Yes. So, so you should check out. Um, we had we had a, a really great cochlear implant researcher come talk about his experience, um, and in particular, he was focused on improving um, music perception. In cochlear implants? Oh, I think I know who you may be talking about. Um, okay. He's a professor somewhere in... Well, he, he, he's, he's not a professor. I mean, he, he, did his grad, his, he did his PhD down at USC at the House Ear Institute. Okay. And, um, and he, he, he did tell me what his professor's name was. And, and it was, <laughs> it was, a, it was a, you know, a famous person in cochlear implants. Okay. Uh, um, but I, I can't remember his name right now. But but if we if we had a great YouTube history, or you know, if we had a great meetup history, uh, the, all these people would be readily searchable, and we could pull up the dates that that joke. I mean, I I want to say it was like mid December, mid November, um, and uh, did someone post a link to the YouTube channel you're talking about? I will do it now. Okay, thank you. Um, now, are you joining it from the West Coast or East Coast? I'm on the East Coast. Okay, so yeah. well, then super appreciate that you're joining us for being so late. <laughs> no problem. This is really interesting. Like, um, So today seems like we're trying to catch up and get a hold of what's going on. Um, what does a typical meetup look like? Well, so um, one, you can check out, I'm, I'm just sorry, I'm just, uh, I pulled up our our page and uh, there's a picture, you know, there's like a thumbnail of me <laughs> on our okay. live stream that's really not, uh, <laughs> not pretty. <laughs> so... Uh, I My wish, camera is not working. I'd be happy to change it. Uh, <laughs> I, I look like I'm yelling into the camera. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that should that should take me. At, ch check out the link I just dropped. Um, yeah, everybody can check it out and see my <laughs> the awful thumbnail. Yeah, there. I need to see this before it changes. <laughs> oh, to, will it update? Okay. Uh, uh, in the December 17th, it looks like John is, I don't know, like drinking something or like. <laughs> he, he just has his hand up. But... No, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. I, I looked, I looked. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, you can see, um, Yeah. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, I I can fix some of the thumbnails. I mean, I I know there's like two missing recordings I need to upload, and oh. I I have a like um, Nurtech SF um, uh, like image. Um, that I use in my streams, but yeah, we yeah, need to not, not picture you like someone who we, we don't we don't need to host, we don't need to host in the world that like Hillary Clinton's a, a what is it? What is she a lizard? <laughs> like you're going to kind of rant about something strange. <laughs> yeah, you uh, look like you're thinking, but not like what you're thinking about. <laughs> Look angry. I, I I look I look angry. Yeah, you, uh, do, you look really perturbed. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to say, but <laughs> it's true. Like the least angry, angry person in, in the world as well. This is kind of silly. <laughs> let me 
let me tell you what's wrong with Neurotech. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so please please check out the check out the old videos. What you'll see in the in the meetup agenda though, um, is is generally kind of like boilerplate from six to six to seven, and and then uh, you know many many times there's a speaker, and um, who we try to have for you know an hour ish. And usually that goes over and then we might cover, you know, some other, some other specific topics that week, depending on if, you know, if there's conferences or cool papers or, um, that, you know, other, other, mm -hmm. other topics, but I, I would love input in terms of like, if there's something you would like to see covered, um, you know, like, it is it is very easy to tailor this um, for for something that would be of interest. Sure, it's only my first time, so I'll keep that in mind. Keep keep that in mind, and uh, but if you've if you've got any you know research experience and and you have a presentation, you can also volunteer. <laughs> 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 to share that with us and um yeah a and that's certainly a great way for us to learn more about your experience and and you know like um yeah like what sure what i'll i'll check out what the other cochlear implant person said <laughs> please please yeah uh, and i currently work um in ibm research cool but, um Fairly boring stuff right now, so this is way more interesting. <laughs> gotcha. So I take it it's you're not working on BCI. No. Okay. Um, uh, if it, so, okay. You you're doing yeah. So we're gonna check in with um. So Joe Joe Crew was his name, uh, okay. and uh, I do think it was mid November ish, and. Uh, he also posted, so he used to work for Advanced Bionics and Advanced Bionics is doing a hackathon or a kind of challenge project um, with, I believe with cochlear data. Mm -hmm. and, um, and certainly there's a student that I've been working with that, uh, that joined that challenge. So he, his, uh, his university has a team working on that, and we're going to hopefully check in and hear about how that's going, because I think that challenge is wrapping up um, wrapping up soon. Again, I, it's it's just awful. I checked my, his, my Slack history with Brian. Totally gone. You know, I mean, Brian Jenkins is the Connectome manager at Neurotech X. Mm -hmm. uh, I could... Uh, I bet I don't even have the history of this um, ear research. Uh, what was it called? Uh, anyway, please, please um, let us know. Oh, take care, Ari. Um, yeah, if something comes up. Um, oh, somebody found it. Okay. It was mid-November. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I, it would be interesting to have you join us when um, we hear about this uh, this particular project that Advanced Bionics was uh, was doing. Sure. Um, but. Um, yeah, what part of um, Moab, which is this mother of all BCI benchmarks project that you can find on Neurotech X's GitHub, um, part of the the motivation for that, uh, or recent recent motivation for for getting that project some attention, was actually adding SSVP datasets. Oh, cool. uh, to to yeah yeah and. Um, and they are, you know, honestly, it's it's it, it makes perfect sense. You know, a lot of the example or a lot of the previous data sets were focused on motor imagery. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, SSVEPs have, you know, such a long, great history in BCI. So, um, I yeah, think they that, also give a very robust signal. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like, like it, it, they, they have a long history because they work. <laughs> yeah, I, I did these projects like uh, back in 2013 and 2014, and I used Emotive okay. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that came up with um, no, because I, I think Mohit's um, Blink and Cerebro, uh, if I remember his project names, uh, I think he was using Muse and OpenBCI. But I'm curious how how did you interface with the motive? Or did, were you using their SDK? Kind of. We had uh, their research version. Yeah. Okay. And um, we were able to like get some raw data from the device. Like, I guess it was not as uh, secure back then, so kind of hacked yeah. into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, no. No. I, I, so this is I brought up SciKit, spelled C Y Kit. Mm-hmm. And like that seems to be uh, a, a somewhat I don't want to say supported project, but it seems to be an active an active Python project that is focused on interface you know giving you raw data access to pre pre the most recent emotive version <laughs> like okay. like um, and their work you know. They've got a they've got an active Discord channel, um, and you know they they've they've got people who are working on the the most recent version. But of course, they've got to reverse engineer that. Um, and but I, honestly, I think it would be awesome for us to just get access to older hard. You know, there's I, I believe there's a lot of those headsets out there, and I'd love to to get those, you know, working with our EEG notebooks, you know, John's EEG notebooks project that um, gives you kind of a, you know, full stack ERP um, data acquisition analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll look at my older hard drives and see if I have some data sets from back then. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And these these were, I mean, was this like this would be SSVP stuff? Yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. That that would be that would be great. Um, uh, okay. Seven seven thirty. Um, what else were we gonna try and okay? So, buzz and review. Um, I haven't gone through the content. Yeah. I I have my little presentation, but I'll give that at like eight or something about something we talked about at the end of last meeting. I'm just finishing with with Andreas. Or yeah, not uh about like it in general, trying to get more devices for Neurotech X. And okay, I mean, because yeah. I mean, what he was kind of uh, saying was that yeah. uh, that he would be, or that they they were considering holding a couple of their beta versions uh, for particular Neurotech X sites. And so it would be awesome if you were. Yeah, yeah, you know, I. Like, yeah, right now I'm just trying to create a general framework and then just slot this in as the first one, hopefully within the next week or so. I just want to get more feedback from people about how they think the framework in general can work because 
getting the device is one thing, but making sure we actually use it and let people know we have it is going to be a community effort. And putting a, yeah, I'll talk about it in a little while. Okay. Okay. Well, certainly let me just say that, um, uh, you know, as a kind of first meeting of the year, um, you know, I'm always looking for uh, anybody willing to help with NerdTechX uh, or NerdTech San Francisco. Um, and, you know, we're not going to be doing any in-person meetings this this year, I'm, I'm guessing or certainly not until probably the fall. Um, but, um, but there's lots of things that, that uh, I could use help with. And um, so please, please get in touch about that if you are interested. Um, of course, we're also looking for anybody, um, you know, not, not necessarily to present yourself, but give me suggestions for things that, uh, or people that I could get in touch with um, and, or things that people would like to hear about for this year. Um, and um, I've definitely got some, you know, I mean, I, I also co-host the, the meeting in Paris on Mondays. Um, so for people on, West Coast, that's 9.30 a.m. on Mondays. Uh, if for East Coast, it's obviously 12.30. Um, I know we've got a lot more kind of like European speakers lined up than I have uh, West Coast people, you know, for, for this month. Um, but um, yeah, if anybody's got some leads, I'm, I'm looking, looking forward to <laughs> hearing from you. And um, yeah, what else? Um, well, it's certainly what I meant to do, uh, Ryan, was I didn't post this meeting on, on Noisebridge's site and was definitely, well, I was kind of hoping that Dan would join because one of the things I wanted to talk about um, this week was at least my experience using NeuroHub and, um, and, and you know what I what I realize now is kind of like the power behind NeuroHub, which is um, Calcul Quebec um, or Compute Canada, and um, you know, like we could really use you know we've we've talked about this in with respect to the Nareka challenge which was, you know, for, for people just joining us for the first time was, was a kind of epilepsy data, data science challenge, um, is having, you know, some, some community compute resources that we could share, not just for, not just to give people access, but, um, but also to give us basically a common, um, you know, a common site to be working on projects, you know, so, um, uh, you know, like a, like a Jupyter hub, uh, instance that where, you know, we can be collaborating on a, on a project or, you know, whether it's analysis or, um, simulations or yeah. I mean, or just just being able to give people, um, like like with the Nurika challenge, like access to uh, a lot of data, and not not having to, you know, have people individually host, you know, um, two hundred, you know, two hundred terabytes of data. Um, so. I don't know if Ryan, if can can you speak yeah. to at all to kind of like noise bridges? I mean, so so one of the one of the reasons that I wanted to post it on noise bridge and was hoping to get somebody like Dan to maybe come talk was um, to talk about as well as the fact that we talked about you know doing for the buzz in review like having noise bridge basically provides some of the the services for the buzz interview, 
you know, like we would love to switch our Jitsi to being Noisebridge's Jitsi server. Yeah. And and if Gather Town is a paid thing, um, whether it was I think it was Sparkle um, Sparkle server, which looked like a open source Gather Town. <laughs> Uh, which is which is what uh, Brainhack had used for the the end of the year Brainhack social. But we have any have any of you guys been to RC three and seen their version of uh, Gather Town? No, I, I, I the Chaos I, Communication Congress I, that happened yeah. in between uh, Christmas and, and New Year's. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really worth exploring because you have like uh you can walk around as a character and they have we can have our own little assembly room and you know, it would be just like, like this and if we wanted to go into a side conversation we could actually just walk to like a corner and have a side conversation. Can you yeah can you turn, um, can you turn the game down a little bit on your your input, John? Um, so I can actually speak a bit of both to okay. both of those because Noisebridge actually had room at RC3 this year at CCC. I didn't go. I was like busy skiing and like really tired every day from skiing. That even though I've only gone a couple days, but um, they. After the first day and a lot of the kinks were worked out, it worked uh, quite well. And the software set up behind that, I'm pretty sure, is all open source and would probably be pretty easy to copy and modify. Um, I do know that we are pretty much ready to switch over to the Noise Bridge Jitsi server whenever we want and it um uh, i just need to check a couple things so that i'm able to easily have the log like i need to remote into the actual server in this space so i can watch and make sure nothing is being dropped um because once i can do that um we'd be able to switch over no problem it um and um with compute resources we are currently doing a lot more research into having more servers up and running both in this space and co-located um in different parts of the world for different projects including i know no, we have some compute server space, I think actually locally even. Um, yeah, I, dropped, I dropped a link and I, I love it because it's on my own network. I also use the name Valis. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I loved it when I found that the Dream Team's server was called Valis too. Um, and and it's, it, it, I mean, it looks like a, a nice, I mean, a really sweet system. Um, you know, the, the what I would love to add is kind of like a um, like a free NAS system to that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, where we're kind of like we have processing, we don't have data storage for input sure. output. So, uh, so I I've yeah. got I've got um, like uh, Ixy systems. Uh, hardware rig downstairs and like can fully populate it and but you know it, it it's kind of useless at my house you know like it would be so much better on on uh, noise bridges network than than I mean it, it would be better close to the compute resources <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I've also been in talks a bit with um the internet archive oh, about yeah. hosting a lot of things like this since they really like hosting large data oh. sets they just yeah. it can be kind of hard to do certain data types and um file types if they're 
really massive, like any single file over a terabyte kind of gets a bit wonky. Uh, that, that's certainly that's not an issue with the kind of data that we're talking about. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't I don't think that's that's really you know an issue. I mean, so so NeuroHub. Um, for, for those not familiar, you can find links to this in the meetup agenda. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's run out of McGill, um, which, you know, has, has put a major emphasis on running, you know, open science um, projects uh, as a part of their mission. Um, and Certainly, you know, with JB as the uh, JB Pauline as the PI of this, um, it's something that uh, that he's been involved with from from you know a long time now, um, and yeah, the the data access in it is is just amazing. Or you know, like it, it's already, um, yeah, huge and. I see that you do, you know, it doesn't just give you access to, doesn't directly give you access to UK Biobank, but you can get, if you have UK Biobank access, then you are, it is available from, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like a layer on top of supercomputing resources. Um, but, but, there was a lot that we could emulate from that that would be very internet archive friendly in the sense that like not necessarily like UK Biobank, but say, you know, running running a data lad server or you know, like running a data lad instance um, so that that the internet archive is keeping a local copy of everything that that Dartmouth is making available from their center for open neuroscience, for instance. Um, uh, like that would that would seem to be like a super no brainer um, that that Internet Archive would be. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of also the Aaron Schwartz Day talks and in particular the neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, I forget I forget his name, but um, you know, these were the kinds of data sets that that he was he was certainly hoping to see see you know more available and you know wasn't really sure where to get them, but um, but that's that's certainly kind of like Data Lad's mission as well as you know that particular center at Dartmouth. Um, as well as, of course, you know, um, Russ Poldrack at Stanford with Open Neuro and and this this upcoming Neymar, which hopefully is is soon. Um, uh, anyway, these are all these are all super. Um, these are all well funded projects to make uh, open data sets, you know, more accessible. And um, and you know could provide us with the kind of you know data size that like well I mean we would love Moab to to basically be be ready to to take on these massive data sets like say Child Mind Institute which has you know thousands of subjects across multiple tasks. Which you know, <laughs> sorry. No. Sorry, I've got to hold my dog so it doesn't doesn't bark. Um, yeah. Anyway, th this this would be. Um, yeah, I mean, other than that, it was also just about. I mean, it was it was really. You know, it was funny because it's like I think I did a NiPy training with you know that JB did when he was at Berkeley. Um, at, you know, like seven or eight years ago, and and you know the funny thing about this NeuroHub 
was that like it was it was kind of like doing a NiPy training, but you were doing it in a Jupiter Lab instance, you know, as opposed to doing it on your laptop. You know, I mean, in some ways, like that 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 was it, right? It was. It was you had a, a real compute resource. So this this Compute Canada, um, yeah, uh, uh, this Compute Canada um, or Calcul Quebec, you know, was was providing kind of like the the nodes, and um, so setting up this kind of virtual virtual server, and then you were using a Jupiter Lab. You know, front end to you know connect data and and you know do do stuff uh, uh, by you know importing various various projects in um, to install on those nodes or at least in the virtual virtual environments for those and you know so there wasn't there wasn't really anything new in terms of you know it was like all kind of like what what neuroimagers would know as like known known projects, um, but uh, okay, I'm just reading I'm reading John's chat. Um, Problem is always that. yeah. So so this is this is um, uh, you know certainly for Neurotech San Francisco, I think you know. I think there is be, and we've talked about trying to do something together with Noisebridge, like like this is something that the the dream team, which is kind of the neuro hacking group at at Noisebridge, like like this is exactly what we could be, what we could be collaborating on is is giving us this this kind of, um, giving us this kind of you know semi-permanent infrastructure that we can be building on and that we can be giving people access to. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, or, you know, I would love to get us access to more. I mean, I, I, I can talk a little bit about, you know, cause I, I mentioned this to John, like getting people access to the human brain project. So Human Brain Project provides this, I mean, this new eBrains uh, uh, provides infrastructure to researchers, okay? And of course, it's mostly people who are in, in you know, academic positions already, um, which is kind of why it doesn't get so much usage is that they have, <laughs> they have resources already too, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, you know, any, anyway, the nice thing about the Human Brain Project is because they're they're kind of not a particular institution, and they are supposed to be trying to provide a service that's linking together a bunch of researchers. Um, they're they're a bit more open than than a lot of uh, services, and the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, right. I mean, it is so. I mean, the binder, the binder instance is is great, right? Um, but it's also it's like, you know, is it is it super easy to attach uh, or to to access a lot of data without doing any, you know? Right, right. So no, it doesn't work for big data, it doesn't work for big compute. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like it's and binders actually kind of annoyingly minimal. Um, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cause it times out after ten minutes or something and okay. probably takes ten minutes to pip install EG numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, it's for really lightweight things, binders nice. And it's there, right? But I actually agree that could be better to have something a little bit more permanent. I mean, it, it, it's like it's like having, I don't know, it's like having, um, you, you know, Moab with all the data that you could imagine, like already available and down, you know, quote downloaded. Um, 
I mean, not that not that Moab's the the best example, but certainly, you know, I mean, really, like, I want to use the Child Mind Institute as 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 my example, not just because <laughs> selfishly it's the data that I want to process, but but because it is such a large data set that one, you know, at least the EEG data is is really not is really I think under under analyzed. Um, and part of that is that nobody's got that space, you know, um, take care. Thank you. Thank you for joining us so late. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's where the new imaging world is going, right? It's like, there's, there's loads of data. Now there's more data. You can kind of pick a, a research question and jump in. Right. And, but uh, there's 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 too much for you to yeah. have the bandwidth to download have the uh storage to store and yeah. have the time to analyze and the first two of those are fairly major constraints the last one the third one is one that you would like to you know that that's the interesting one but you want you want like solutions to the first two that don't don't take up more than fifty percent of your project energy, right? <laughs> um, I think that's the kind that of, these these are the kind of things that are going to be. You know, obviously they're facing us in this way now because we're talking about it. But it's actually a general question for science. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in this decade, and NeuroHub yeah. is did you know aware of that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I would love and and I I kind of want to say that. Um, that JB would be open to actually talking about this some some evening. Um, I don't know if we can, you know, hopefully he wouldn't mind being the evening. He, he's been on Berkeley time before. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, where where does um, or you know is is NeuroHub just essentially the the Canadian version of of Open Neuro, right? Because open neuro, okay. You want to? No, I mean it's because open neuro isn't an analysis platform, right? Well, it, so that, that's what I wanted to say that it is. Well, it's not an interactive analysis platform. They'll run free surfer for you. They'll run fMRI prep for you, but it's not unless they've added some new feature recently. Yeah, I don't think you can. You get like interactive Jupiter Hub type. No, 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 no. Data, it, it, ac data access, right? You can specify pipelines and code that does that uses certain tools. So yeah, yeah like it, so that's. I think the idea of NeuroHub is more like giving you a compute instance with access to data and letting you do stuff. Yeah. Uh, whereas Open Neuro is really it's a it's a storage repository that will let you run some fairly limited um scripts yeah no for sure for sure Green life is more interesting yeah so i would love uh i mean again like selfishly i'm <laughs> looking at some of these uh uh and would would love some some feedback or you know love to hear what you know about them um uh but certainly where things ended with Neuralab, I mean, NeuroHub, um, you know, the way they, they want to, uh, yeah. So you, you give them a, a, a Docker container and, or, you know, if you already have it as a singularity, they're just going to convert Docker containers to singularity. And, um, and then you can run it with NeuroHub, right? And, and it seemed to be a kind of thing where it's like either you already had access to um, Compute Canada or, you know, like they, they were able to offer some, some access to that or Calcul Quebec. And, um, and I wasn't quite sure if like the Calcul Quebec, I think like the Calcul Quebec was kind of their way of running was there Jupiter Hub? Um, uh, and, and, yeah, 
anyway, but but um, and and maybe they're they're kind of like their local storage because some somewhere they are keeping you know a version of of UK Biobank and like uh, a number of um, Alzheimer's data sets and um, well I put I put links you can get like you know the intro um, sorry I'm trying to find where I've where I've got this. Uh, yeah. For those who haven't, um, oh, take care, John. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, our, I don't know if John's already left, but um, anyway, this would be, you know, I, I don't know, Ryan, if, um, you know, what, what the kind of like access uh, might be to something like Valis, or if that's something, you know, something we could get Dan to join us, or, you know, who, who would be the best person at Noisebridge to talk about that. Dan, Dan oh. would more than likely be the best person to talk to um, their meetings for people who might want to check them are usually on Wednesday nights around, I think, 7 or 8 p.m. Yeah. Pacific Standard Time. Um, uh, let me find a link to one of the places where they usually announce um, their meetings and their discussions. Um, and um, yeah, Dan would know how to access Valis and um, uh, probably um, what it takes to interface with it and um yeah they haven't used it a ton um from what i've heard um partly because of i think the storage issues like literally earlier this week we got a new two terabyte hot very high throughput server up and running um like it has 50 terabytes throughput each way in terms of internet transfer bandwidth. Okay. Like, it's very fast. It doesn't have that much storage, and he said it isn't the most stable, but it is in Los Angeles and is very fast when it does work. Um, but, yeah, right now, getting right now we're using it kind of as a scratch storage test server with just some small video files and photos and stuff um but i think we if it works well we might get another server like that for doing neurotech stuff on that needs high throughput um though having a actual in-person server at either noise bridge or co-located in the bay area would probably be better for overall access if people need to download stuff and run it locally it, it i mean certainly you know i don't think it's so much that you need um like to download a bunch really quickly, like that's not usually the, the big problem. It's like having that local storage so that your, whatever your compute system is, has access to that data. Yeah. Right? And um, 
and you know certainly like the the cool thing about data lad is that it only is going to pull the data that you're actually going to use so what what you can you can kind of see you can kind of see all the different data sets that are that are available and and then you know pull when needed <laughs> any as well as and you know this is i mean not that um that we've got a bunch we're not we're collecting a bunch of data but um but say you know um like the 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 people who've talked to us about like hey i might have a data set that uh, that i can contribute yeah. you know is is that um you can be a data provider uh, uh, for data yeah. too, right so um and and you know it, it I mean, it would be a great conversation to have with the Internet Archive of, yeah. uh, you know, like certainly being able to have um, a local copy and and f what we could potentially do to basically help the Data Lad and Center for Open Neuroscience in terms of providing, I don't know, like a, a West Coast uh, um you know, a West Coast cache. Yeah. Um, that... I mean, getting it on the archive actually caches it all over the world. Like, right, the Internet right. Archive isn't, okay. can't sure. actually fit all the data they currently have. It's actually split between, I, I don't know how many colleges worldwide right now, but I know, I think, MIT, um, Stanford, Berkeley, um, quite a few European colleges all have part of the cache and sure. overlapping parts of certain caches, which sure. would be very good for something like this is if, because universities are likely to use these data sets. So, and this would probably make them more open to hosting their data sets on the archive as well, which so, would be helpful. As far as I know, like nobody's um, nobody's doing that with the Child Mind Institute data set. And and some of that is because it is it is streaming bit like like <laughs> it, 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 you know because of it being this uh, EEG, like high density EEG data sets, um, they're actually a lot bigger than, um, than a lot of fMRI data sets, you know? And um, yeah, so um, yeah. So together, together with, you know, what I would want to call like, the best kind of pre-processed versions of that because like honestly you know i don't know yeah i mean you wouldn't really want to redo the pre-processing on all this data um uh you know so this is one of the reasons that i brought this up with um with zurich because um or you know with with abby who's now at in zurich because it turns out that University of Zurich hosts a pre-processed version of the EEG data. Um, yeah, so that's Nicholas Langer. So, so this is the Auto Magic developer. So this is this is something that Devesh was working on, um, who's the you know awesome EC um, undergrad that. Um, that has been working on some of the ERP core data, but he's been using, you know, it's basically like redoing ERP core, but with auto magic and as opposed to ERP cores kind of hand processing. And we can talk about some of the differences between their, their manual, manual processing versus what auto magic gives you. Um, but, but that's, that's what Nicholas uh, has done with, with auto magic um, is the pre-processing of child mind institute data. So, you know, together with, um, it, you know, the other, the other person I wanted to follow up with on that was um, uh, Bradley Voitex lab, because I know that they've looked 
I, I know that they've also done some of the, some processing. I mean, it would be great to, you know, have uh, all the foof results, um, for instance, uh, that they've got. Um, Cause they've, again, they've done this on, you know, at least, you know, many, many hundreds of subjects. I, I don't know the last time that they actually grabbed a, a chunk, but um, uh, at this point, I think Child Mind Institute is up to close to 3000 subjects. Um, so, you know, there's really no, no equivalent EEG data set. And, and this is all 128 channel data, right? You know, multitask, I mean, it's, 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 you know, I still think it's like better than the human connectome project data. Um, because they've, they've, you know, not, not that they've got the, the, the same kind of fancy scans that human connectome project has, but, but they've certainly got multimodal neuroimaging, you know, multimodal MRI, fMRI in multiple tasks and high density EEG in multiple tasks. So this, they've got the 3000 subjects with MRI as well. Yep. I mean, here, let's, let's, I mean, you know, don't quote me until we check out the, uh, so it's hosted on, yep, here we go. I, I want to say, or I know Nitric is doing some of this. So, yeah, because I, I think release nine just came out. Um, so, okay, I, I mean, I, I'm definitely seeing over 2000, sorry. I'm not quite able to do all that arithmetic in my head, but you know, it's 16, six, you know, 616 plus 159 plus 202 plus 402. <laughs> All right. I that know. is a lot of data. It's a, it's a huge map. Uh, sorry, this is the page I'm, I'm looking at. If you, after that link, if you go here and, you know, so you can see the EEG and the MRI and, you know, certainly what's beautiful for those interested in uh, finite element modeling is you can do, you know, it's T1, T2 diffusion, right? So everything, everything you'd want for a real head model. And, and because it's Child Mind Institute data, it's ages five through 21. So you're, you're gonna see basically you know, there's going to be changes in the skull over time. There's going to be changes in, you know, uh, um, the kind of gray-white ratio, right? Because you're, you, you know, basically you're looking at adolescence, so you're going to see all the the myelination that's taking place and and peaking, at, and you know, at the end of your of your data set. Um, uh, at least in the males, <laughs> uh, in their twenties. Um, and yeah, I mean, so it's, it's a really nice, yeah. I mean, nobody, nobody's trying to do that kind of modeling. Um, cause I, again, most, most of the people are still really just mining the, the resting state network gradient stuff. I don't want to generalize on that. Oh, take care, Jaden. Um, yeah, but now I really want to get a full number of those. Uh, oh. Sorry, my I'm using uh, the latest. Right here. I've given myself too much monitor space. <laughs> Two 
takes a while to get this stuff around, okay? Two thousand seven hundred and seventy-eight subjects. MRI. It's pretty good. <laughs> and you know, it's it's yeah, it's quite it's quite a battery. Um, there there are some differences. I mean, I think they've got more. So. That's the number of MRIs, which so they definitely have the EEGs for those subjects or like almost, you know, it's mostly like the EEG is a superset of the the MRIs, like for for some reason, like they don't they don't have MRIs for everybody that they've got EEG. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know if that's an issue of age or, you know, metal or you know like whatever um I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any backstory that's important um yeah and and it, of course there's there's great you know genetics on all these subjects and um They've even, you know, I, I bring this up every time, but, you know, they've even got the baby teeth from these subjects <laughs> just so that they can look at uh, heavy metal exposure and things like that. Um, can you not do that while we... <laughs> My dog's rooting around. Um, how are we doing on time? So... Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to, you know, so I would love to see like this accessible, you know, be be happy to do, you know, trainings for people so that they can, you know, start to use this data. Like this would be an awesome resource because um, you can learn about neuroimaging as well. I mean, you can you can learn about MRI from this as well as as EEG. Um, and even better about the integration of the two, because again, like there's lots of high density data sets that doesn't, that don't have MRI and there's lots of MRI that doesn't have EEG data sets. I'll just keep her on my lap. Um, yeah, so Hey, Lucas, would you like to, um, is there anything that we could be covering for you? Hello, are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah, hi. Hi, uh, it's not my first time on Hack Night from Eurotech. No, Because sure. I went on a Paris one and you invited me to participate in... Yeah. The SF2. Yeah. So it's my first time in this hack night from this branch of Neurotech X. Uh, I work in a BCI to control a wheelchair with SSGP, but I'm really new in this area. I'm an undergraduate student in computer engineering. So. I'm trying to do my first steps and get more information if possible. And I think this contact may help, help me. And maybe I can be help, helpful here too. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, so I just wanted to check in and see how things were going. 
how's I mean I, I'm sure everybody's had the holidays, but um, is there is there something in particular that you'd like to hear more about? Um, nothing. Uh, how can I say? I think anything anything about uh, neuro neurotechnology is interesting to me. Okay. Uh, all information given here is is interesting to me. Okay. I have not specific thing to. Sure. I want to listen now. Okay. Okay. Just just wanted to to check in. Um, yeah. Is uh. Yeah, Ryan, did you want to um talk about uh, hardware stuff? And I I think. I don't know if Josh wanted to also give us an update of what he's, uh, he's been yeah. doing. Um, we're talking about right now. Uh, you're you're muted, Brian. Uh, I'll go in a couple minutes. I sure. didn't finish typing a couple things. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Josh. Oh, sure. Um. Actually, hold on, let me log in my laptop real quick, then I can screen share a little bit. Um. Diego, I, I, I take it you're now a wholly owned subsidiary of Teledyne. Teledyne? Uh, well, Diego, um, Diego works for FLIR. FLIR was oh. just bought. I, I don't know if Diego's currently listening. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yeah, sure. that is correct. Teledyne just bought FLIR, yeah. which is, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Let's see what happens. What's what's Teledyne's big, big thing? Yeah, I, I was researching recently about them, and they develop a lot of uh, surveillance and military type of technology. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're also focused on is studying meteorites, probably for mining purposes. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so it's, a, it's a it's a broad uh, spectrum of things, but I do know that they they focus as well in surveillance type of tech. Sure, sure. Well, that's that's Fleer's thing too. Yeah. Correct. Fleer <laughs> cameras are wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. So the the infrared technology is gonna. It's actually the reason for Teledyne to buy FLIR yeah. is because of the IR technology uh, we developed there. Uh, but I do know that the main attraction is, uh, again, the military surveillance type of technology. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not super thrilled about it because we have a, a huge uh, a niche for brain computer interfaces to incorporate IR technology as well. But yeah, at this moment, you know, there is more money in, <laughs> unfortunately, in military there, in there, projects. There's always more money in the military <laughs> budget. Yep. Again, not super, super thrilled about it, but at least I have access to, you know, to knowledge about these other cool IR-based technologies that we are developing. And I think that that's going to be the, the main uh, focus for Teledyne moving forward as well. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so related related to infrared. Speaking of uh, uh, nears, um, Josh, what have what have you been doing? Yeah, uh, share my screen here. One sec. Um, okay, so well, regarding nears, um, this is my this is just the PCB layout for for my current sensor that I'm using. So I've I finally like released this device. I finally got it working well enough that I can actually ship these. Um, so I've shipped out like um, like seventy of them right now, and then I got more. Um, and then Crowd Supply, they're gonna put me up so I can I can try to get another bulk order of these. Um, so all this is is just an infrared, like or it's just like a pulse oximeter sensor. Uh, but I spaced out the sensors uh, about an inch from the LEDs, and so then in typical FNIRS fashion, you put this on your head and then you get like an arc, right? And then, you, so then the signal you measure back has, uh, a lot of that light is actually bounced off the surface of your brain. Um, and then I so, can see. So Josh, just, just so I understand. So 
So basically, the is, is that thirty millimeters? Yeah, yeah, thirty millimeters. So thirty millimeters between the emitter and the sensor. Right, right, and you can. There's there's like multi sensor designs where they'll have several sensors from like two centimeters all the way up to like six centimeters apart. Um, yeah. If you crank the lights up, you can get even farther, um, which is what I'll get to experiment with here hopefully soon. Um, so uh, so then the sensor um, it's nice because it's just like a de dedicated analog front end for doing two photodiode measurements, um, and then it has LED drivers built in. So I'm doing like whatever, 20 microsecond LED pulses, and I'm sampling at um, 4,000 samples per second. Um, and then that gives me a really high resolution, you know, pulse image slash FNIRS image. Um, and then I'm using it in the dumbest way possible right now, where I'm just taking the, um, the, in, the ratio of red to infrared light and then using that as a general measurement of uh, brain perfusion. And then you use that as a biofeedback training measure. Um, and then this is, uh, <laughs> this is what I've been writing uh, right now. It's, well, hold on. The, <laughs> the code's not that interesting, but I'm, I'm working on a, a digital phase lock loop um, equation so I can extract uh, pulse frequency, and then I can start doing uh, heart rate, well, pul pulse rate variability measurements. Um, and then that'll be cool, because then I'll be able to combine that with the, the basic HEG training. Um, and... I don't know. It, it, I, I've learned a lot about pulse oximetry, you know, this past year, and um, it, it's kind of amazing how much diagnostic information you can get about like your arteries or yeah, you can see like heart murmurs. Um, and then in terms of the brain, um, you can really see when a person's reacting to stress or if they're having like attention issues because your your frontal lobe, uh, it it, I, I still don't completely understand it, but but your brain's it's allocating blood flow wherever it needs to do something and then when you get stressed out or if, like due to conditioning you can basically like that won't work so well and and it'll throw off like your your homeostatic state um and then so you can actually train that to get better uh cognition better stress management etc um okay so then then the other thing i'm doing is um I'm studying EEGs and working on designs. So I'm helping, I'm helping Dimitri with his free EEG32 board. And uh, I'm supposed to get those, <laughs> the headsets from Bernard here soon. He's finally shipping them to me. So then hopefully that'll mean we'll get the crowd supply up for that as well. Um, but then meantime, I've just been kind of studying, you know, learning everything about the hardware. Um, and this is the latest prototype I've made using this chip that just came out um uh, 2019 and then uh it's just like a seven dollar <laughs> or four to seven dollar like eight channel 24 bit chip sigma delta 32,000 samples per second 128 uh, x gain and then like the built-in um voltage reference on it is like I, I really have a hard time finding a better one <laughs> so it's pretty amazing so for like four potentially for seven bucks you know i'll add some filters on here maybe if i need it like I'll have a full EEG like analog front end, and then I'm gonna plug this into whatever microcontroller uh, that works, and then uh, hopefully I'll have a you know an EEG for 15 bucks <laughs> that, that does eight channels and and you know whatever signal quality you want basically. Um, uh, so I'll have that in a month. I don't know what else. Um, well, so sorry. Go back. Go back to um, so free EG thirty two. Yeah. Um, so Bernard's getting um, Bernard's getting his um, kind of flexible. I mean, it's flex PCB, isn't it? Um, his... Yeah. Um, actually, let me see if I. Yeah, I wish I wish we had good pictures for some pictures for him. for all of this. Um, Quick yeah. question. Yeah, do we have access to all of these uh, uh, schematics? Like for for yeah. example, to identify the components, so, the values, the chips you are using. Yes. Yeah, I have this all up online. I don't know if I have the Gerber files made, but I, I can just. I well, can um, sure. 
for the, I have the BOM, like all of that's going to come out. So for this chip, like I just mm -hmm. made it. So like you can have the, you can have the designs if you want. And I'm going to be writing um, like free Arduino libraries because I have to write the whole spy protocol stuff from scratch. Wow. And, um, cool. So this will all be, you know, ready to use basically. Um, and then I'll be selling them hopefully if, they, if they're good enough, you know. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have a name yet for the projects like that people I, can easily search for? Well, so my the FNIRS project is called HEG Alpha, and then in terms of doing EEG and like the bigger, what I you know what I want to do is integrate these different BCI tools together, right? Because you don't that's not really available right now. Yeah, I'm working, <laughs> on this whole, um, I'm working on this whole web front end basically, so I can plug in. Uh, hold on, where the hell? Okay, here. This is just. Uh, this is all super work in progress. I, I'm I'm working on like a way to plug in like all these apps are modular, and then I can plug them all in, and I can call on like different connection protocols if I want. So browsers now actually have well, at least Chrome has a serial interface built right in. Yep. Um, yeah. And it's really good. I mean, I, I was shocked. And, and then uh, this is for my FNIRS device. Um, it, it's cool because this is a progressive web app, so it actually installs. And then this, so this is like a local build and I can run it on my phone as well um, as like an app. And then like, it's cool because with web, it's just so easy to plug into whatever uh, communication or faces you want. So like, you know, I have the full suite of communication for whatever devices I might be working with. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's kind of a big experiment, but I'm hoping to make just like a big BCI platform for the, oh, that's funny, giant star. <laughs> And uh, and then I'll have these really cheap sort of Arduino devices and, you know, my own kits so that you can just use them out of the box. Um, nice. and it's, it's all free, open source. And then, you know, the hardware as cheap as possible and sort of to the standard that you would want for at least, you know, a low-grade research device, as best as I can get. I mean, the, the specs of these chips are pretty amazing. And then uh, mm -hmm. I have to do a lot of my own analysis work and all that, but it's theoretically we could have the best of the best and also at the lowest price because I mean, that's what the market is, you know, if you can mm -hmm. do the engineering yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's all for me. Sorry to interrupt a little bit. It's just that uh, I'm very happy to see this actually. Uh, I'm uh, an electrical engineer. Uh, mm -hmm. So I always kind of come from the hardware perspective Sure. I also work as an FPA uh, designer, so programming is also one of my skill sets. But I always advocate for the hardware aspect of brain-computer interfaces, EEG devices, etc. So it's right. it's very specific. You know, you are dealing with electrical signals from the brain. You want to understand the electrical nature of how right. you process it and so forth. So yeah, this is great. And I was thinking, you, you said that so this board that you have right now doesn't include the mic the microcontroller right um, it would be right, to this is the analog front end and then like i'm gonna see i'm gonna i'm gonna see if the esp32 works and if not i'll i'll, I'll find something else because there's microcontroller can add noise and you have to be pretty careful with that but okay. but the whole is all like kind of you know i'm doing this all like arduino style so i'm trying to make everything modular so that you can do whatever yeah. the hell you want and then I'm making really accessible ways to to use it, and, and then see how it works. I mean, I'm learning, <laughs> so, so I'm thinking, actually, I was, yeah. Actually, I was thinking if you are learning, oh, fuck, it's my so yeah, my well, I to yeah. I don't know if you can hear me, but yeah, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, this is a blast, honestly. I get to just obsessively do this every day, so I'm gonna keep going <laughs> as long as I can, you know. Yeah. So the 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 free EG32 is is also all the all those plans are are you know all those files are available too. Yeah. And, and this is part of a big project as well. Dimitri, he's working on like a 64 channel device right now, and he's he's testing these now because I, I pointed them out to him and. Um, yeah, he's he's on the same wavelength for sure. Yeah, he's awesome. yeah, and and um, 
And, you know, Jaden, who was on earlier, has at least tested that um, that you can access the free EG32 from BrainFlow. Because mm. that was what Andre had added for us. Um, and so anyway, we've we've got two systems. Um, we've got two units that are available for other engineers to work on or work with or you know interested developers um, one's one's in Moscow one's in the states um, uh, and the last I heard uh, is um, Devesh is working with Bernard on the coherence things that he needs yeah but how, how are you doing with coherence in the in your web app um, well I, I can't demonstrate it right now um, I, I have it actually all working. Um, I have, so I can do, with the GPU math I wrote, I can do like hundreds of fast Fourier transforms uh, in real time. And then I'm working on making it so I can combine that with the coherence. But it's it's good enough to where I can have like 20, well, the way I'm doing it is I have a, let's see here. I'm going to show you a picture so I can explain this a little, a little more straightforward. Um, I mean, all all Bernard needs is just two channel two channel coherence. Right. So like I have that I have that all working. Um, but then I'm I'm making like a cool visualization system. So like it's mapping it for you and like I'll have all these these visuals are all responsive. Um, and it it draws like connections between like it's doing coherence per channel. So uh, as you add more channels in here, you'll see, see connections forming based off of the amount of coherence like measured. And then mm -hmm. it's a, <laughs> I, I have like a whole task of working on the, like the local storage system and, and how to dump the data without, you know, it's a lot of data, um, but uh, it, it all works. Yeah. And then uh, like the performance is amazing. Um, I'm just re I'm like reworking the app right now so that it, it's like actually written like a more more professional app, and then um, it's a lot easier to add features to it now. Um, and then I'm gonna just yeah, this will be like a full uh, alpha coherence app, and then I'm I'm going use case by use case. So you know that's what Bernard wants, and you know that's alpha coherence is pretty fun. It's it's really straightforward in terms of the math, and then um, like I don't know, coherence is really like elegant in terms of the signal analysis and like. Uh, I've just learned a lot. <laughs> we just just want to be able to get. I mean, you know, again, like Bernard, Bernard has, a, you know, a market for devices, right? That's kind of specialized, but um, right. But you know, he's someone who's who's put a lot of money right. into development, um, or he's he's supported a number of people in terms of this development, and be just. Awesome to get, you know, because again, like his feature needs are, are you know, kind of like minimal. Um, right, right. And yeah, I, I built this all around, you know, making it for Bernard and then. Uh, I mean, because, you know, because if, if he can get out uh, a, a, a working version that that meets, you know, this this particular customer needs. Right. Uh, I am absolutely sure that he will use, you know, his his profits to, you know, like he will reinvest his profits in the further development and and yeah. Yeah, we we we've, we've talked a whole bunch about this stuff. Okay. Um, okay. He's going to help me with some more projects too after this. Okay. So, um anyway, it it would be great for us to, you know, like Certainly, one of the other things we need to do um, is, and so I, I've talked to Mohit about having a free G32, you know, um, co co like project um, uh, slide in the buzz in review, you know, talking about this as like, of very much a network of people brought together through Neurotech X. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And so, I mean, if anyway, let's 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 try and get everybody who's working on it 
to um, to talk like soon so that we can um, just agree on what goes into a slide or two so that it because Mohit's willing to, to have that in the buzz and review that everybody's you know the content everybody's going to talk about across across all the chapters so I think I think it'd be I think it'd be great um, because again, it's it's like Diego saying like it's a great example of like we you know we've got some great software projects like EEG notebooks and Moab, but free EEG thirty two is what I would call a you know and and really your Hedgeduino, uh, Hedge Alpha um, you know is like open source hardware that right. yeah that yeah. it's all gonna get matched together too yeah and. Did you say that um, you talked to Kyle about doing some some testing? Yeah, he. Uh, well, he. I mean, I, I showed him my DOT prototypes, and um, I mean, he, he offered to pay for it, so so he's he's all aboard. Um, I, I'm just I guess have to find the time to finish the actual design and then test it. So okay, he's he's gonna help me with that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, does um sorry to bring up a kind of semi i don't know uh, more more kind of like software engineering uh, dependency problems but um is anybody following these changes with q t and the the you know What's what's happening with five point fifteen QT? Like only only um, commercial support bug fixes or something like that. Like it, it's kind of killer just because um, ME CPP, which is a, a really great uh, yeah, open source project to give you acquisition software. That that includes uh, um, or th that also has a BrainFlow plugin, so it can access free EG32 as well as all the other devices that BrainFlow supports, like OpenBCI, um, BrainBit, um, Neurosity. What else? What am I else? What am I missing? Oh, uh, yeah, GTech Unicorn. Um, is cute. It's a QT app. <laughs> it's a QT app for, you know, um, and this seems like kind of a big deal. Um, I've, anyway, I don't, I don't know if anybody's following that, but I, I'd like, I'd like to learn more from people who are maybe, you know, kind of like more conventional software engineering shop that is, you know, even better is potentially going to be paying for the commercial support. Um, but I'm curious what open source projects are doing about this. Oh, uh, I haven't been following. Oh, right. Brain stimulation. Yes. So, um, well, you know, I, I would, um, we haven't talked about the hardware hub recently. Um, and yeah, and some of that is, has just again, been the, been the holidays. Um, but I, I would love to see us, um, there are a couple kind of what I would call low cost devices for electrical stimulation, you know, that, that like you can consider safe, <laughs> like, like they're not, you know, um, they're not sophisticated, but, you know, TDCS research TDCS started with people using very large um, sponges and you really just want to make sure that um, you're getting a a safe device, right? And if it's if it's battery powered, right? 
like it it's not going to it's not really going to hurt you <laughs> um but but there's yeah so there's some devices that you know i've pointed people to um the reddit tdcs um or you know as as one option just because that's a community where they basically share you know results with a number of devices that are sold um these are what i would call like off-label devices you'll need to unlock your ipad first <laughs> okay <laughs> I, I what, what phrase did I say that brought out that reaction from Siri? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't even know. Label but... device. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think I said anything that would be an obvious trigger word, but um, a, anyway, it's it's. Um, Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to to have some some options in the hard in, in the hardware hub for, you know, like nothing nothing fancy, but but devices where where it's like you could give yourself fifteen minutes of stimulation. Um, for have instance, you tried the Neo Rhythm band? N no, D and it's like uh, RTMS. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so, so, so like, I've never really understood what they mean by, well, so R RTMS, it, you know, like, I've only seen that with, you know, real big coils. Yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm curious, I, I've got to say, um, there was an awesome video, Brain Clinics, uh, Martin Arns, um, in the Netherlands, Brain Clinics um, has uh, another YouTube video um, where he's got the uh, basically the the first developer of TMS uh, talking about his you know his graduate work like 40 years ago, and uh, it's a it's an awesome video um, to hear um, yeah just to hear his experience. But like one of the things he talks about is that like to doing TMS it, it is actually kind of a, like 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 it was harder it was harder to do than he thought just because of the electrical demands. Yeah, and, and you know he was an electrical engineer, right? And um, so I'm super curious about this device in, in the sense that like. Are they doing TDCS or you know? Because I don't think they're doing TMS, right? And if they, yeah, it's just, it, that that is what the product is telling you. It's selling. It, it's even in the box. RTMS device. No, no, no. I, 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 I mean, and, I've uh, seen, um, I've seen their yeah. like Kickstarter or their website, mm -hmm. like. I've seen the RTMS, and they they say something like like low field RTMS. Yeah, or yeah. They, they say something else that's like, is that is that a thing? Pulses, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, it sounds kind of weird, and it's actually weirder uh, using it. It feels so weird in your head when you when you turn it on. In so I keep working. So uh, uh, I've been for uh, almost two weeks now. It's, okay. it's a very it's a very short time. Okay. I tried a bit. So we, we there's no way we could interest you in a teardown. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, uh, like like. Can we can we open it up and see what the actual circuitry is and see if we can figure out? I'm actually really curious, and I, and I'm very tempted to open it up, but I'm not gonna understand anything there is well, inside. 
and this is why we will use the power of the group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will use the power of the group uh, uh, to better understand, you know, because I, I really want to know, like, yeah, is, is it is it doing, I mean, you know, there's a couple options, right? So it's either it's doing something conventional and is just for whatever reason is using the wrong acronyms, right? It's doing yeah. something novel and like maybe it is using the right acronyms, but it, you know, like we need to see more. Or, What's the device you're talking about right now? What's that? What's the device you're talking about? The what's it called? Neo Sorry. I don't know. Yeah. Serious. I'm gonna write the name in the chat. So. It, it's the one we've we've seen this, John. Like, um, yeah. I think on Slack, um, didn't like Graham chime in and was just like, "Low field RTMS isn't a thing." Yeah, that sounds exactly what how the discussion went. <laughs> It was like, like I mean, this was like eight months ago or something, right? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, a and he's right, right? Like it, it is, it, you know, it isn't a thing. Could they be yeah. doing something else that is conventional? <laughs> or, oh, or you know, actually, static field TMS is a thing that's explore being explored. It is like literally you just stick a you just stick a magnet on your head uh, a uh, you know static magnet that isn't generating yeah. field when you pump electricity through it and um, and that it definitely has some kind of effect on brain activity right so that's a thing, but, but that's not necessarily a weak that's still a strong magnet but it's just not a fu like time fluctuating magnetic field yeah and and, and so again like like i i believe these reports where it's just like people say they turn it on and there's something <laughs> uh, anyway I, 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 we need a tear down. Yeah. Or an x ray. Yeah. Like, that's that, something. That, that. Or an x ray. Yeah. I, like, I, I would, actually, we should combine two things. Like, like, yeah, like, terror hurts. <laughs> yeah, real, real imaging. Uh, um, so we could see, yeah, see in the inside. Yeah. Like, uh, I know one of my friends in SF, he literally. Took an old X-ray machine and modified it just to scan electronics. That's awesome. And I have another friend who he's like one of the best reverse engineers in the Bay Area. Like, like ancient chips mm -hmm. on old hardware that need to be fixed. He'll scan and then like actually dissolve layer by layer every layer of the PCB if it's a shielded um mm -hmm. ship um and yeah it's really cool um but yeah um also i'm ready to give a very short oh, presentation yeah. Sorry. please yeah rock on yeah um yeah so i'm going to share my um window um Let's see. Are you guys able to see the window I am sharing? Yeah. It should be a just a Google Doc. Yeah. I'm, I haven't turned it into any type of special presentation, but this is just a little overview of something I've talked about a couple times before and because now we actually have companies that are more interested in donating stuff. I wanted to actually get it written up, but it's pretty much a plan for reviews, testing and distribution of different neurotech gear in our community. Um, like the goal is partly to get device 
manufacturers to donate hardware to neurotech chapters as it is very beneficial both to those companies and to our overall community um and even other communities outside of ours if we publish data using those devices um and it's pretty simple to do, which is just figure out what people want, email companies asking for it, review the hardware, and then distribute that hardware. Um, companies, I think, would be interested because it would help with publicity of their device and it, how to use that device which in the neurotech field is one of the much harder things, is teaching people how to use new hardware. Like, new hardware usually doesn't have a lot of guides. Um, testing and feedback for the actual device, the more people who try a device, the more feedback they can get, and it allows them to have people develop on their device. This would also benefit neurotech a lot um, as it would allow us to create hardware lending libraries at different chapters of our neurotech X. Another major benefit would be that members would be able to test out equipment before they buy it. And some of this hardware is expensive. So testing before you buy is a very important step. Um, and it allows for the development of applications by the community, for our community to use, the device manufacturers community to use, and just the neurotech field in general to use. I have a... Li the list of different hardware to look into for donation. I know we already have some of this hardware, which would make it where we could review and like use that hardware to go through these different steps and uh, figure out how well this can actually work. So I put on some EG headsets, other BCI interface devices, wearable biosensors, AR and VR stuff, and some stuff that is tangentially related to neurotech or to data capture when you're using a neurotech device and you want to have other data collection or you have a specific way you want to use that data in an application with another device. Um, robotics, computer hardware, which right now a lot of people don't know exactly what type of computers they need to develop for some of these devices. Like, yes, you can always go, hey, I'm going to spend $3,000 on a computer and it probably can run most of this stuff. But not everyone, especially students, have that type of money. So if we can be like, this is the minimum viable computer you'd need to use this hardware, that could be very valuable. Um, and uh, I looked at like th at least three neurotech chapters I think would be good to start this project uh, with to a degree, which it... Uh, SF chapter, because we have weekly meetings, we usually, when, during non-plague times, have them in person, and they're open. We have a lot of members in our local Bay Area community, and a large secondary community through groups like Noise Bridge and other local groups who would be interested in joining up at times um the montreal chapter since that's one of that's the original location and a lot of energy in the neurotech 
X community is in Mon the Montreal chapter at times, the Paris chapter, which also has weekly meetings and is very active. And that would also give you three different countries' perspectives on things like getting that hardware to them. Because I know in quite a few other tech industries, the barrier is their country actually more than the hardware is it's hard to get stuff in a lot of countries so the more countries that can be like yes we were able to import this device the better with like without having to go through tons of regulations and then i created a blank email template pretty much um for what you could send out this is kind of will need more revisions and then i created a example email to one of the companies that we talked about last time which is cognition um and um it reads pretty well right now but could use more work it pretty much set hello to them it's it's written like a regular email ask for device hardware or stuff but this could make it easier for different groups to ask for hardware i say what we plan to use the hardware for and if possible i think it would be good before asking is to give them a little bit of a testing the waters with like how many people want to test the hardware, how many would be interested in reviewing it, who already know they want to use the hardware, and how many projects already might use the hardware, and how many people would probably end up having access to this hardware in the long term. Um, and then some links. Yeah, so it's it's pretty simple right now. I think a lot of this could mainly be done um, by doing a few things on the NerdTechX website, like creating a form you f people fill in when they want to ask for hardware making sure it's easy for people who want to review stuff to review it on the hardware hub, make it easy to put pages on the hardware hub for devices we have reviewed, even if we aren't able to sell them through the hub at that point. Yeah, so that's about it. I'm that, done. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, man. I wish to start a review channel, like an unboxing channel. Oh, yeah. Channel. Yeah. And I, uh, get, uh, I, I could make the reviews in Spanish. I could make the review of the EG Duino uh, also. Yeah, that, that reminded me. I didn't put about um, languages. That, that's one of the important things that I wanted to uh, um, And yeah, having the, um, uh, uh, buying the device and getting it to send it to your country is kind of hard, it's kind of difficult. It's also sometimes kind of expensive. Maybe through this, platform we can even get the sponsorships or i know some ambassador in places where it's not very common this kind of hardware yeah 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 like i'm kind of bringing this from my vr knowledge which i've gone to a couple like big round tables on international and low cost access to hardware for VR around the world. And there are many countries that can't even access hardware or it's at double or triple the price because of import fees. And that 
when there is hardware lending libraries or public places to try out hardware that increases adoption of that hardware tremendously. Um, things like maker spaces and hacker spaces that have VR hardware have spurred a lot of growth of that hardware in that local area very often. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where my thought process from the for this began. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Can um can you share that Google Doc? Oh yeah. And, yeah, because um I mean I I, I want to follow up on it. Um it's it's nine o'clock and I know I'm getting um I'm getting called out um for for yeah for the evening um but this is this is great ryan and um yeah i mean as well as being i mean it's it's a service that i think we should have plus it's the kind of thing that um that i think you know will help us with a a pitch for you know getting a cognition unit um so kudos double kudos <laughs> um okay i you know you guys don't need to all uh sign off but i i need to <laughs> and uh um let's see next next week i don't i don't have a speaker set but um you know, if anybody's got suggestions, let me know. Um, I'll try and follow up with uh, at least some of our first time people and see if anybody's interested. Um, and then two weeks is the buzz and review. So, and I'll, I'll certainly be joining, uh, um, you know, Bolivia, South America, uh, on the Wednesday and then we'll be doing the Thursday. Um, and yeah, check out the, the few links. I only have a couple links for, for next week events. Um, but there's something, Oh, well, ner, ner, yeah. So, um, these aren't things that are workshops that are open, but, um, but super interesting, uh, Allen Institute events that are going on. Um, and yeah, like a, a lot to be learned from from the kind of animal electrophys that the Allen Institute is doing. It's it's you know not a lot of groups have these kinds of devices, um, you know these neuropixels devices. But uh, but this is actually one of the things that I'm super interested to follow up with the Dream Team at Noisebridge about. Um, and maybe I'm going to get that. That's actually one of the speakers that I'm going to try and get is a uh, grad student at um, Brown that used the open electrophysiology hardware. Um, I forget it's like what that particular kit is called, but it, it's the hardware that is used to collect data. It's the DAC that, that um, people use with Neuropixels probes to collect data at like 512 channels at like crazy sampling rates of like 30 K. And what he did was he made, um, some open hardware and, you know, plans all available on the web, um, for basically making an EEG front end that works with this, works with this equipment. And, um, so hoping, hoping to talk more about that because, this is this would be like open EG hardware that has performance specs that is like way beyond what is currently commercially available for research systems. You know, it's it, it, it just in terms of like super high channel count and super fast sampling rates. And yeah, so hopefully, hopefully we'll get. Uh, I want to say his name is Chris Black, but. Um, Anyway, I, I will follow up on that and um, yeah, so see you, see everybody next week.